name is Will Supis. Thirty years old. I live in Franklin, Tennessee. Being youngest of four was interesting dynamic in the family. Um, for me, I had to be the the jokester to always calm the tension in the house because there was definitely plenty of that. The relationship between me and my father was never good. Because there was things in my past that happened that I always wanted to come to my father and present to him and say, you know, hey dad, how do I work through this? How do I, how do I get through this? And I can never do that. I can never present those to him and ask for guidance because, you know, there's just things that stick with you. Where I was more pissed off most of the time, being around him in situations um, where I just wanted more understanding and more connection, more love from him. To have my father say, you're a f***ing mistake, is something that I will never, ever forget. I heard that over a few, few separate times throughout my life. It just, it really cut to the, cut to the deepest part of who I was. There was um, a point in my life where I did suffer some sexual abuse, um, not from anybody in the family, but some, from somebody outside the family. I had such a shame and such a weight on me already from not having a connection specifically with my father, so I couldn't necessarily bring that to them. I couldn't bring that situation. Because in my mind, I, it was already my fault. I, I screwed up somehow. So music is, um, I'd probably say it's everything for me. And that's why we made the move from the Chicago area to the Nashville area. I mean, that was the big push. We were, my wife and I were both in Chicago, both in the corporate realm, and we are just had a day where I think it was like a 14-hour day. We sat across from each other on just dining room table, eating some dinner late at night. We are like, there's got to be something more to this in life. I thought about the idea. I said, let's try Nashville. We love music. We want to move south. A good friend of mine said to me, because he had seen where I was in my life and I was just struggling. I mean, day in and day out. I just, I couldn't connect with things. Um, and he had come to me graciously and said, this is something that I've gone through. I think you should, at the very least, investigate it for yourself. So I did. I found that I was, I was very significant and that I was born with a purpose. Um, and yeah, I was, I had a lot of hurt in my life and I had a lot of pain. But I think for me is that I was able to acknowledge what that pain was and to find um, not only understanding but to find healing whatever you've gone through it doesn't matter that's who you are you know God doesn't make mistakes not by any means you know he may allow things in your life to happen that you don't understand but you never you're not a mistake Nobody is. Well, good morning, Horizon. How are you? Kel Rickner is the name, and uh, it's good to be back in Ohio today. If you go uh, right up Route 75, about three hours, you'll hit Toledo, I think. About three hours, right? Go left for about 30 miles, you'll hit Archibald, Ohio. Anybody know Archibald, Ohio? Souter Woodworking. All that type of thing. That's where I was born and raised for the first eight. Well, all my family's still there now. I just happen to be stuck out in the middle of Illinois. But I'm a Buckeye at heart, so it's good to be back. I don't know if you're Buckeyes around here, but I'm a Buckeye. And uh, at least born in the great Buckeye State. Great to be with you guys uh, today. Now, I have to tell you as well that I have a great memory of uh, Cincinnati. That's where I did some blowing in the wind a few years back. And uh, we were down here with the Bible quiz team when I was in seventh grade. I had about $10 with me for the day. That's back when you could buy lunch for about a dollar. Got into Kings Island, could ride all the rides you wanted to. But I got stuck in one of those arcade games. Found out that I was an addict at the age of 13. So I started, I think I was trying to shoot the star out of one of those, you know, a little red star out of one of those little pieces of paper and, and trying to win one of those great big uh, bears or something for whoever my girlfriend was that week. And, you know, I said, all right, I, I blew through a dollar. I go, okay, I'm going to go four more quarters. That's it. 
I got the two dollars and had one, and I said, oh, okay, one more dollar. I blew through the third dollar. Still didn't win. I was always so close. And then the fourth dollar. And then the fifth. And then the sixth. I, I'm not, I'm not making this up. It was ten o'clock in the morning. We're going to be there till six that evening. And I drained everything trying to win that stinking bear without winning it. And I'm walking around for the rest of the day with a hole in my pocket, beating myself up. How could you be so stupid? You know, this type of thing. So Cincinnati, I have great memories from down here. <laughs> but it reminds me a lot of people in life are going through life like that. Disconnected, trying to make sense out of how it's all supposed to work and particularly out of how do you get connected with God? How in the world do I have a relationship with Him? I want to deal with one of the fundamental questions today that a lot of people wrestle with if they're going to think about it at all. How, how can I be sure that, that heaven is going to be my home? Now, it's all connected in relationship with God. But the question comes up, how good is good enough? Because we all go through life beating ourselves up. We make our mistake. How good is good enough? How do I know that God accepts me? How do I know I'm going to be with Him when this life is over? Those are all fundamental questions. Sunday school teacher was attempting to explain this to her six-year-old class. She had talked about, shared with them about heaven and how they could know they're going there. She just wanted to make sure that they had caught what she had said. So in an attempt to discover what they already believed or what they believed about the subject, she asked a few questions. If I sold my house and my car and I had a big garage sale and I gave all that money to the church, would that make me good with God? I could, I could go home to heaven. No, 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 no. Okay, she said, well, what if I cleaned the church every day and mowed the yard and kept everything neat and tidy? Would that get me into heaven? I was like, like a great worker for God. They said, no. And then she started thinking about some other things. What if I, I, I was kind to animals and I gave candy to all the children and I had a great marriage and did a lot of good things in the community? Would that get me into heaven? No. So she finally said, well, how can I get to heaven? What does a person have to do? One kid jumped up with his hand in the air and just shouted out, you got to be dead. <laughs> and therein lies the problem. Got to be dead to go to heaven. Consequently, you got to be dead to know much about the place. You know? And more often than not, you ask someone on the street how a person gets to heaven, and they'll say something to the effect, well, you just have to do your best to be a good person, right? It's the most popular theory going today. Most people seem to have a built-in assumption that all good people go to heaven, and that's why I have observed at hundreds of funerals, it doesn't matter how good or how rotten the person was, it doesn't matter whether they loved God, hated God, it doesn't matter whether they believed in God or denied His existence, once they died, all the talk was how they're in a better place now. Guarantee, Prince's funeral, probably had a little of that, in a better place now. So, I've never heard anyone, and I've, I've done lots and lots and lots of funerals as a pastor now for over 30 years. I have never heard anyone say about Uncle George or Aunt Harriet at their funeral, well, if heaven's for good people, they sure ain't there. Nobody says that, right? I don't know how this heaven is for good people theory became so popular, but I think I know why it did. And first is because it seems fair, right? By fair, I mean that people who do good deserve good things. In life, you get rewarded for your efforts. That's part of our human experience and expectation, so it makes sense that it would work that way with God. It's just fair. Second, it coincides with the notion that there's a good God, and if there's a good God who dwells in a good place, then it makes sense that He'd fill heaven with good people, right? It wouldn't be heaven if there are all kinds of bad people there. He's a good God, He fills heaven with good people. Third, it offers us a sense of comfort, because while we know we're not perfect, we all know we're pretty good, and since God's good and heaven's for good people, then it makes sense if we don't screw up too badly, and for the most part we're pretty good people, then we'll go to heaven. Besides, virtually every other religion in the world teaches the same thing. Our deeds here in life determine our destination in the afterlife. 
Now, I have to confess, I've always had a little trouble with the evidence for good people. I've had a little trouble with that theory over the course of time, but I never heard anybody really uh, speak to it until pastor and author uh, Andy Stanley came out with a little book a few years ago, How Good is Good Enough. I want to just summarize maybe a few of his arguments, backed in with a few of mine, and and take a look at a couple of the problems with this theory today. How do I get connected to God? How do I know I'm good enough for Him? How do I know I'm going to go home to heaven? Well, problem number one is this. We, we don't know exactly what good is. Even, even you talk to religious leaders, they're going to have different ideas of what good is. So how do I know whether I'm good enough? Well, it depends on whose definition, I guess, we're looking at. Because we've all become a little, I, I suppose, a, familiar with certain religious zealots in our day who are convinced that blowing... Blowing people up is good, right? And it secures them a place in paradise immediately if they do that. Now, personally, I think they're deceived. I think their doctrine comes straight from the pit of hell, but who am I to judge? Right? They are simply following the teachings of the religious leaders. I mean, that's what, that's what most of us do. The difference is just in the application. You believe God wants you to love your neighbor. They believe God wants you to blow up their neighbors. You're attempting to do what you think is good in God's eyes, but so are they. If being good, at least the way I measure good, will get me into heaven, then the terrorists won't be there. And yet they think that their next suicide mission is going to take them directly there. So who's to say? We, we have different standards of good and can't quite come to consensus of what good means. So that's a problem. A second problem is this. Our own definitions of good are susceptible to change. Now think about it, because over time, we've all changed. Some of you think back to when you were 20, and you would have said, yeah, I was a good person, but man, you might have been smoking some of that funny stuff, doing weird things, maybe sleeping around. I, I don't know what it was that you might have in, you know, back there, but maybe today at 40 or 45, you're going, boy, oh boy, I hope my kids would never do what I did back then, right? You would never want your kids to do the things that you did. Because you look at them now and go, that wasn't very good. See, and over time, things have changed. You're like, what was I thinking back then? You weren't, right? But here, here's the point. We change. And as we change, our, our values, our morals, our ethics change. So which standard does God use? Does he, does he grade us off of our adolescent standard, our, our, our single and free standard, or our married with children standard? Or, or does he have his own set of rules that we need to live up to? Because if he does and his standards don't change, then we couldn't have been good at each stage along the way. Or at least we hope he grades on the curve somehow. <laughs> Problem number three is God hasn't given us the scoring system for how good we need to be. And this can be very frustrating because if he's a good God, you would think he'd make clear how good we have to be in order to be accepted by him. Especially in light of what's at stake. If this... If I'm dealing with my eternity, I, I at least want to know what I have to do to take care of that, right? So let's say it's the first day of school and your professor informs you that your class grade will be based entirely on how well you do on your final exam. She then announces that class is dismissed and there will be no further class meetings until the end of the term. You throw your hands up and you say, well, is there any book we're supposed to read or anything we're supposed to study? The professor smiles and says, no, none of that's necessary. Just, just be ready for the final. Well, how can you get ready for a final when no one's informed you about what you need to know? That's part of the problem with the good people go to heaven theory. If there is life beyond this one, and where you end up is determined by how your test score here, how you do on your test score here, then do you, do you really have anything specific to go on? It'd be helpful. I mean, be good is about as helpful as just study. How can I know what to study if the teacher doesn't tell me? How can I know how good is good enough if God doesn't give me the scoring system? How do I know that I'm not going to find out in the end that while I thought I was good enough, God had a different set of expectations? And right away some people will say, well, hasn't he given us his scoring system in the Bible? Like maybe trying to keep the Ten Commandments and... That's problem number four. And that's the Bible doesn't offer a definitive path to heaven through good works. There's no place in the Bible connected to any list that says, if you do this and this and this, you will go to heaven. You'll be good with God. I love the story that Andy 
shares in his book about his seminary days, and he was talking to his neighbor Phyllis one day. And she made the comment, well, if something were to happen to me, I know I'd go right to heaven. And Andy said, really, Phyllis, why is that? She said, because I keep the Ten Commandments. That struck Andy as strange. She said, Phyllis, do you even know the Ten Commandments? She smiled and sheepishly admitted, well, I think I know a few of them. Then he asked her, do you know where in the Bible the Ten Commandments are found? She said, nope, but I sure as hell don't break any of them. (laughs) And I just laughed when I read that because here this lady didn't even know what the Ten Commandments were, yet she was convinced she hadn't broken any of them. She couldn't even tell you where they were in the Bible. How does she know she's keeping the list? See, and the problem is, even if she had kept them perfectly, there's nothing in the Bible to suggest that keeping the Ten Commandments or any other list of laws will get you into heaven. There were, there were a lot of folks in Jesus' day who, who were rule keepers and assumed if they kept enough of the rules, they'd get into heaven. But Jesus really messed up this theory with a fifth problem. And that is Jesus turned this theory upside down. He infuriated leaders of the religious establishment in his day by declaring that even the best among them were not good enough to reach God on their own merits. He said in Matthew 5.20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, I mean, they they were the professional rule keepers. They had taken the Ten Commandments and turned them into 613 laws that you keep. You kidding me? But he said unless your righteousness exceeds that, you're not going to get into heaven. The Pharisees taught that you're good enough you didn't, if you didn't commit adultery. Jesus came along and said, hey, now it's all about having an adulterer's heart. If you even look lustfully at a woman, you've committed adultery. So you've already messed up. They said, well, if you don't murder anyone, you're good enough. Jesus came along and said, you ever had hatred in your heart? That's the heart of a murderer. you got the heart of a murderer. You're a lawbreaker. That's not going to get you into heaven. So if according to Jesus... The guys who made a living out of being good enough weren't good enough. What hope do we have, right? And then, too, he seemed to contradict himself. One minute he'd tell some of the most religious people they were they're never going to enter heaven. And then he'd turn right around and say that a lot of bad people would get into heaven. Like the prostitutes and the cheaters and the tax collectors in his day and murderers. I mean, what's up with that? So here's the truth. If we recap the good people go to heaven theory, and as good as you are... And you're probably pretty good. I mean, you're Buckeyes after all. You know, you're from Ohio. You're good folk. The problem is you can't ever be really sure that you've been good enough. You hope so. And you're certainly better than some people you know. But how good is good enough? Where's the line? Where do you currently stand? And do you have enough time left to stash away enough good deeds to counterbalance your bad ones? Just who's in charge of this operation, and why hasn't God given us a little clearer direction? I mean, if our eternities hang in the balance, it should be good, a good thing to know that we're going to heaven before we die rather than find out too late that we missed it. Which leads to the real problem with the good people go to heaven theory, and that's this, problem number six. It's based entirely upon our own subjective standard of comparison. How good we are depends entirely upon with whom or what we compare ourselves. See, the problem with that is that barring a common standard of good, most of us assume that we're far better than we actually are. I remember the day that my notion of how good I was as a basketball player was rocked by a sudden adjustment in my field of comparison. See, I experienced a lot of success in my high school career. We had really good basketball teams up there in northwest Ohio. I went on to play basketball at a small college which was the NCCAA, the National Christian Collegiate Athletic Association. I received all American honors while playing there. And and, in the early spring of 1979, my sophomore year of college, we made the final four of the small college national basketball tournament. As a result of our success, we, along with every other college basketball team in Indiana who had made it to postseason play, had been invited to the Hoosier Dome by then-Governor Otis Bowen for an event which was dubbed a salute to Hoosier hysteria. 
following a nice banquet. I, I didn't even know what we were going for, you know, but we're down there and we have this nice banquet. And all of a sudden, they, you know, they're telling us that we're going to receive the highest award that the governor can give. I still have this, this deal. That's the highest award <laughs> that Governor Otis Bowen could give me, man. And uh, we were going we to walk across the stage. He was going to present them to us personally, all this type of thing. And walking in there, listen, now listen, I was, I was from a, a Bible college background, Fort Wayne Bible College at the time. But walking in there that day, we, you know, yeah, we're, we're humble college students, but we thought we were big stuff, you know. Until we found out who else was there. The other teams present that day included Bobby Knight, the Indiana Hoosiers. <laughs> Indiana State, who had just finished runner-up to Magic Johnson. And the Michigan State Spartans in the 79 NCAA Finals. Some of you may remember that Indiana State had a few guys who could play. One guy named Larry Bird, who wasn't there that day. I think he was on a recruiting trip somewhere. <laughs> Purdue was present, including their seven-foot Joe Barry Carroll. Anybody remember that name? He went on to play several years in the NBA. I remember after he received his award and came down, he walked right past. Our table was right up front. He walked right past me. I looked up, and I'm like... Because he looked like he was up there somewhere. He looked down at me and said, hi, son. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, how does anybody shoot over something like that, right? Notre Dame was there. They had, uh, I think, three future NBA guys that played. Some of you remember Kelly Trapuca, Orlando Woolridge, who played for the Bulls. Bill Lambeer, who played for the Detroit Pistons. Their coach, Digger Phelps. Remember those names? Some of you, you're old enough. Remember those names? I sat there in stud silence as I watched these 6'8", 6'10", 700, 250-pound guys walk the stage. I had never seen so much size gather in one place in my life. But try to imagine it. They call IU, Purdue, Notre Dame, Indiana State, all these national collegiate powers up across the stage, and then Fort Wayne Bible College. <laughs> what are you laughing about? That wasn't lost to me. I'm like, what's wrong with this picture? Now all of us 5'8", 5'10", 6'foot, 150-pound guys got up and walked the stage. And I, I tell you what, I, want, I wanted to crawl under the table. Some of you parents remember those books called Where's Waldo? It was pretty apparent who Where's Waldo on that one. Everybody knew who Waldo was in the room. I'll never forget the van ride home, the lesson that was indelibly impressed upon my fragile ego that day, and that is how good one thinks he is is largely dependent upon his field of comparison. And once my basketball field of comparison had been rudely adjusted, I could no longer think of myself as being quite as accomplished as I had formerly thought. That trip was a reality check. But here's the point, you know, a person can go through their life uh, being really skewed in their judgment as to how they're good in basketball are really not going to hurt them that much. But you go through your life really skewed in your judgment about how good you got to be to be accepted by God, how good you got to be to get home, to make it to heaven. That's a problem. Because you find out too late that my field of comparison was really messed up. Yet I find that multitudes of people are deceived about this today and they say, I'll make it into heaven because I'm basically a pretty good person. And my question is, compared to whom? I was talking with a man one day who pulled out this good people go to heaven theory, so I asked him to explain something to me using the following diagram. And I'll just put it right here on this, this deal today, what I did uh, with him. I drew a line across the top of my paper. And I said, we're going to make this a 10. And the Bible tells us, I think we can all agree, that only God occupies, if 10 is perfection, only God occupies perfection. Right? I don't think any of us here, Pastor asked, anybody here going to put themselves, anybody here perfect? And somebody in the back stood up. He's like, sir, are you telling me you're perfect? He said, no, I'm standing up for my wife's first husband. <laughs> Sorry, I'd throw that in there. God's the ten. The, 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 Bible, the Bible tells us uh, He has angels flying around Him at all times saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah 6 and verse 3. He is perfect. He's totally separate from sin. So He's the only ten. So what I did with Him, I, as we were sitting there in the restaurant, I just no numbered it on down. 
And I said, uh, so if God's the only ten, let's figure it out. If heaven's for good people and God's a ten and he's separate from sin, how good do you have to be to be good enough for him? He said, I don't know. I've never thought about that. I said, all right, so let's start grading some people out. I asked him, where would you put Mother Teresa? And Mother Teresa consistently scores higher than virtually anybody else. So he said, well, I'd probably give her a nine. And I've even heard Mother Teresa when she was around, and you can read some of her writings, and she would tell you that she, uh, you know, people might put her up there on the pedestal, but she was pretty aware that there was quite a gap between her and a holy God. I, I, you know, Billy Graham occupies rare air, so I said, where would you put Billy Graham? And he put, he put Billy at about a seven. I said, you, you don't know me all that well, but where would you put me? He, he said, uh, well, I'd put you there with Billy. I thought, oh man, that's, woohoo, good. Cal Rickner, up there at Billy Graham. I said, where would you put you? He said, probably a three. Now, we could, have, we could have gone on and on, but I think we had made the point. And I said, now, I don't know if you've recognized it or not, but you've created something of a dilemma here. I, I said, nothing here helps me know where the cutoff line is in terms of who gets in with the Holy God. I said, for your sake, you're hoping it's a three or above, Right? Because if it's something above that, you got a problem. And for my sake and Billy's, we're hoping that it's seven on up. And Mother Teresa at a nine probably hopes that she's in. And then if you say, well, you start doing this, you say, but I'm not sure it really matters. Then you've got another real problem because now you're saying a one, two, and three is no different than a seven, eight, or nine. And we all know there's something not fair about that. You're telling me it makes absolutely no difference? You can just be as rotten as you want to be and you're good? Versus people who spend their life trying to be good? I said, so what's the cutoff line? And more importantly, what's God's cutoff line? And again, he said, I don't know. And then I went on to share with him what I consider to be the greatest news in the whole world for people who really want to know for sure that they're going to heaven but wonder if they're good enough. And that is this. If you get nothing else, write it down today. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. The Bible says no matter how good we've been, we still need forgiveness because anything below a ten cannot be accepted by a holy God. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. In fact, you may be a really great person compared to everyone else, but your standard of comparison isn't with everyone else. It's with the absolute perfection of an almighty, holy God. And when you turn the light of His holiness on your life, it's like, you know, the paint job, and you put the really bright light on there all of a sudden, All the stuff shows up. All the imperfections show up. And so the Bible says, when you turn the light of His holiness on your life, no matter how good you are, Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags in His holy presence. Romans 3, 23 from the New Testament says, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're, we're all something less than a ten that we that we need to be. That's the bad news. If we're going to get in by being good, we have to be as good as God. And and, and guys, even though again you're Buckeyes, you may be good, but you're not that good. But now here's the really good news: we each can receive the ten we need purely as a gift of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians two eight nine, for it is by grace. You have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works. It's not by being good enough. It's not by trying harder. It's not by works, so that no one can boast. The righteousness you need to get into heaven is a gift 
God gives you when you put your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at this. Romans 3.22 says, This righteousness from God, this perfect ten righteousness, comes to you. Look at this. It comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This is pretty amazing. Because most of us have understood, by faith in Jesus Christ, I can be forgiven. That's good news. But by faith in Jesus Christ, he places a 10 on my head. Not just forgives me my bad stuff, he gives me the good stuff. He puts a 10 on my head. He says, you get the righteousness of Jesus credited to your account. That's amazing. Now, does that mean it doesn't matter how good or bad I am in this life? That's exactly what it means in terms of how I get to heaven. Now, how good or bad I am in this life is going to determine the quality of life I get right now. It's going to determine the kind of connectedness I have with God as I'm walking through this life. But the fact is, your good deeds can't qualify you for heaven, which is really good news if you're not sure how good you have to be. And your bad deeds can't disqualify you from heaven, which is really great news if you've got a few big mess-ups in your life. Because the righteousness you need can't be earned. It can only be received as a gift through faith in Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He does come in and He changes you. And you begin to desire you know, when you've got a right, when you've got, when you know who you are, you've got a 10 on your head and he calls you the righteousness of Jesus. There's something inside you that begins to believe that. You want, you, you, you want to walk in righteousness. But listen, you're doing the good deeds and you're doing these things now, not in order to earn from God, but because of who you already are in him. You see, I'm not trying to earn anything. I'm, I, if I have good deeds in my life, it's just flowing out of the, it, it's the overflow of gratitude for him. To him for what he's done in my life. It has nothing to do with earning anything. I've already got everything I need. He's put the ten on my head. And so I know I have what I need to be right with him. Look at this verse found in 2 Corinthians 5.21. I consider it one of the greatest verses in the Bible. It says, God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin. You know when Jesus hung on a cross for you because he loved you? When he hung on a cross for you, he wasn't hanging there because he had sinned. He was the sinless one. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Why? So that in him, we put our faith in him, look what happens. We might become the righteousness of God. We receive all of the righteousness we need through faith in Jesus Christ. That simply means that Jesus took our less than perfect score on the cross. I sometimes hang my three, my four, my seven, whatever it is, and I say, this, this is what happens when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He takes that number off of you, and there was a ten hanging on him on the cross, and he takes that ten and puts it around you. And now you're clothed and you're dressed in the righteousness of Jesus. And God looks at you. He doesn't look at all the bad that's happened because you put your faith in Jesus. He sees you as the perfect ten. And because you know that's who you are now, you begin to live out of that identity. That's how life change begins to happen for you. I look at that and I go, wow, that takes a lot of pressure off, doesn't it? Rather than trusting in my goodness, which I can never be assured is good enough, I now trust totally in the faithfulness of God who cannot lie and has promised eternal life to those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And not only that, but I no longer have to wait until I die to find out whether I was good enough to get in. The Bible says God wants you to be walking around with life now. He wants you to be walking around with assurance now. He wants you to know before you go where you're going. And look look at it. This is exactly what the Bible says. 1 John 5, verses 11 to 13. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Now watch this, because I always use, you know the stacking dowels? I forgot to bring them along. I usually take one of these smaller dowels and say, okay, this is life. And then I stick it inside the next stacking dowel. And, and I said, now, this life is in the sun. Where's life? In the sun. Now watch this, because if the sun has life, life is in the sun, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he comes to live inside you. If the life is in the sun and Jesus Christ is living in you, where's the life? It's in you. See? This life is in the Son. And so this is exactly what it says. He who has the Son has life. Because life is in the Son. He who does not have the Son of God 
does not have life. Regardless of how good they are. Regardless of how bad they are. If you don't have the sun, you don't have life. Because life is in the sun. So you invite the sun into your life, you get life. Because you have the sun. And then look what he says. I write these things to you who believe on the name of the Son of God. So you may know you have eternal life. There's not a one of you today. You might be here exploring the claims of Christianity. Maybe this made sense to you today. But there's not a one of you today that have to go out of here wondering, I wonder if I'm good enough for God. The issue is, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Because if you have, God put the 10 on you. You have what you need. And now he'll begin to work in your life to help you become like who you already are in him. I want to ask you to just bow your head and your heart. I want to pray with you. Thank you for letting me share with you today. But I hope this makes sense to you. And again, if you've just been one who maybe has been wrestling with that question and you've never been sure about it, man, God wants to give you life right now. And all you have to do is reach out to Him and release your faith today. And you can, he, he responds to your faith. Maybe pray a prayer or something like this. Just say, uh, God, thank you for helping me understand this today. See, so says, there's not a one of us to get to this understanding without God opening our hearts and our minds. So if he can open your heart and your mind, he's, he's knocking there on your door of your heart. And let him know, Father, I want to just, I want to invite your son into my life today. So I open my heart to you. And I ask you to come in and not only forgive my sin, but I ask you to come in and give me life. I thank you, Lord, that right now by faith, I can know that you've put that ten on my head. That you've placed your ten in my life. That I am good enough, not because of anything I've done, but because Jesus Christ died for me. And so I invite you into my life today, Lord. I want to live for you from this day forward. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, then you'll help me, Lord, to bring forth good works out of my life, not as a way to earn anything from you, but as a way to live in gratitude for what you've done for me. And I just pray this now in the name of Jesus and give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here. Today. Thank you, Cal. Appreciate you being here. If uh, any of you have any questions or want to know something about Horizon or to talk further about what Cal has talked about, we would love to dialogue with you. Drop by the hearth room, third door on the left. And if you came prepared to give, remind you offering boxes are out in the hall just to the left. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you back next week. Well, I've been running down across the road, underneath the bridge where the water flows.